you ever seen that set in the show? Yeah. Sort of like this, huh? I grew up in the 1970s. And um, pretty much like that 70s show kind of in existence. But ever since I was a little guy, I wanted to be a scientist. Uh, this is actually um, my birthday present when I turned five. <laughs> and like a lot of people my age, I was completely enthralled by this, by Apollo. And the, the build-up to Apollo that was taking place in the 1960s and 70s. It swept me off my feet. And I think, you know, one of the most interesting and least appreciated gifts of Apollo is how many people get enthused to go into tech careers. They didn't all end up in the space business. Although some of them are coming back, and that's partially the subject of this talk. Um, some of the billionaires who are now starting the commercial space industry, guys like Jeff Bezos, who had to go and do something else and started off being a book peddler, right? <laughs> he was always interested in space. In fact, he ran his sense chapter uh, at his university students for the exploration of in space. I think I was pretty typical of uh, kids in the 60s that were swept off their feet by this. And um, like Dan, I want to talk a little bit about my career as a contest for uh, this Sunday morning presentation. I've gotten to do a lot of interesting things, and I never imagined as a kid who wanted to get into the space business all the kinds of interesting things I get to do. Um, early in my career, I started off with sounding rockets, and I worked, as you see here, in mission control, on shuttle missions, uh, flying experiments. Um, I went to South Pole on a scientific expedition and got a chance to do Antarctic astronomy. It's a lot of fun being an astronomer. Um, I flew F-18s for NASA for four and a half years. Flew WV-57s to the high altitude nighttime astronomy, the high performance jets. Tried out that didn't succeed uh, to be a shuttle mission specialist, uh, but got into business of being principal investigator on NASA missions. Now they're involved in 26 of them. Uh, the one you see on the right and the rocket you see on the left are New Horizons, which is on its way to Pluto. Uh, and uh, we'll arrive three years from this month, so stay tuned. Um, many people think of me as a former NASA executive, as associate administrator, um, testifying in front of Congress, giving speeches, and setting budgets. But since leaving the agency, um, I've gone back to the technical side. Uh, to a large extent. So I'm back to running New Horizons, uh, which we launched in 2006. PI and Rosetta, PI and Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, uh, and some other programs. Uh, but I've also become very interested in commercial space. Uh, these are actually pictures from the Zero G flight in 2010. I took my family on. That's uh, my son on the right, and one of my daughters used to love me, my wife, brother over on the right. And uh, gotten involved in commercial space a lot of different ways including a suborbital program I'll be talking about. But where I really want to start is not with my own career, but with the aviation business, much further back. This is a picture taken at Kitty Hawk in 1903, one of the first flights by the first guys to do it, the Wright brothers. And the really interesting difference between the development of space flight and the development of air flight is how rapidly air travel to how slowly space travel was advanced. This was 1903. This was actually the year that uh, my grandmother was born. And by the time she was college age in the 1920s, there were airlines. Pretty modern technology compared to those uh, wooden and cloth airplanes of the 19th of the century. And by the 1950s, <laughs> I love this picture. <laughs> 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 But the best it's thing you! I got a little too early. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, no, there's a difference between having kids and me. I'd have been looking out the window. The thing that I really like about this picture is that it illustrates how common in 50 years air travel had to come. And here's this little guy in his Collier's Magazine image from the 1950s. And he's more interested in the drumstick than the view out the window, because clearly he's been flying before. Right? So children are, are routinely making air flights half a century after the Wright brothers. And we had modern air transport by the 1960s. And something like that started with space flight. 
we went from Mercury astronauts, suborbital and the very earliest orbital flights, to lunar expeditions in eight years. It sure looked like it was going to go fast. There were expeditions traveling to the moon two or three times a year. Increasingly sophisticated geological, geophysical exploration going on, going from short walking traverses to long ones, to longer and longer stays, more and more spacewalks on the surface. Vehicles that would let them roam across an area the size of the Boulder Valley. And so when movies like 2001 came out, looking at a future 30 years off with space stations like this, and moon colonies like this, I can tell you from the standpoint of the time during Apollo, it didn't seem so far off. It didn't seem unrealistic. That's not what we got, and here's why. <laughs> um, too many cooks in the kitchen. Too many other objectives, too many other agendas. And I can tell long stories about, about uh, running a NASA science program, about other agendas that Congress has, even for space exploration. How many jobs go to my zip code instead of how far we get the ball down the field? Um, I'm pretty sure you can go talk to any chef in any fine restaurant in the world. And the chef, if you ask the chef, what's the optimal number of cooks in the kitchen, the answer will never be 535. As a result, Apollo simply ended. Not because we ran out of things to do, but because we ran out of the will to do it. And we traded that for some really interesting things, a space shuttle, that later built a space station, but nothing like the future that we imagined in the 1960s and 70s in terms of exploration. And we have been tooling around in Earth orbit for almost 40 years now. It will be exactly 40 years come to center since the last human expedition beyond Earth orbit. And it's only for lack of will. And that lack of will translates to a lack of money and because we've only had one model since the birth of spaceflight for conducting human space exploration, a government-led model, centrally managed, centrally planned, a little bit ironic in that beating the Soviets within the end of the space program is very Soviet-like. We have not been able to make very much progress, and it's the antithesis of what happened in the airplane business. A lot of those rapid advances were because it was taking place in the commercial sector. People found a way to make a buck. They were competing with each other for new innovations. Dozens of airlines were around by the 1920s. And by the 1950s, although there were less because of a shakeout in, in, in the industry, air travel had become common here 50 years after the birth of human space flight, and almost no one flies in space. We don't launch thousands of people per morning as we do out of Denver Airport here, and that's one of the watch a handful of people per year. I think the most exciting thing that's happening in the world of spaceflight, and I say that as a scientist who's, whose mouth is watering for curiosity to land, who's excited about all the new programs for things like uh, New Horizons, but also astronomy and Earth science. We are going through a revolution in what we understand about the universe. But I still think the most exciting thing going in spaceflight today is the birth of a commercial space enterprise. And it traces its history back to the X Prize in 2004. This is something that Peter Diamandis launched in the late 1990s, modeled after some prizes for um, innovation in air flight in the 1940s. And uh, basically he raised a prize purse of $10 million in order uh, to incent individuals and entities to create a private human space flight program that could go not to orbit, but just suborbit up to space and right back down. Very short flights, like the first flights of Alan Shepard and Gus Grissom uh, in the 1960s on American space, spacecraft and the S-15. And to do that repeatedly, they set up some rules, and there were about 20 entities that entered. Only one turned out to be um, uh, capable of getting to the finish line. It's a company 
that Burt Rutan, the legendary airplane designer, uh, put together with financing from Paul Allen, who had always been interested in space since he was a boy watching Apollo and made his billions in Microsoft. And um, for the price of $30 million, less than a small spectrometer on one of uh, NASA's discovery missions, they put together a human spaceflight program from scratch. They designed it, they built it, they test flew it, and they won the X Prize with multiple flights to space in 2004. And it turned out to be very exciting. People from all over were enthralled. In fact, enormous crowds came. Uh, I asked Bert in 2004 what, what, what was the most surprising thing he learned in building Spaceship One in the carrier, White Knight One. He said, the most surprising thing I learned was crowds started showing up. And the one thing that I didn't have in my budget that we had to start providing for was very large numbers of porta potties because <laughs> were showing up in the desert every time I do a test flight. I never would have expected that. Well, lots of people uh, got interested. And on October 4th, 2004, the anniversary of Sputnik, the day that Bert carefully chose uh, to win the X Prize, to make the final flight to qualify them for a $10 million purse. The fellow on the right in that image, Richard Branson showed up. And they announced that they were going to turn this into a tourist line. They were going to uh, go into business together through TAN's company, Scale Composites, with a new Virgin company called Virgin Galactic. Uh, Branson never being um, uh, prone to understatement. And uh, they would enter this venture together and within a handful of years be flying tourists to space for the price of about $200,000 a seat. Pretty pricey, like a really expensive sports car. Uh, but he also uh, announced that they had quietly been going around talking to people who might be interested and already had about 100 signed up. So they entered this venture in 2004. It's taken a lot longer than they expected for a number of reasons, and I don't even go into that. Uh, but uh, the White Knight was finished by 2008, much bigger carrier aircraft. And uh, I guess Dan left so we don't have a pointer. Uh, the spaceship was rolled out in 2009. These are real vehicles, not fictitious vehicles. They're actually out doing test flights. This is in the Mojave. This is one of the earliest flights. Who's got that? Thank you. One of the earliest test flights um, of the spaceship. And uh, although they have not yet flown powered flights because they've been waiting on their propulsion system um, uh, to finish development and testing, they have been doing approach and landing tests like the Spur and shuttle flights before the shuttle propulsion was ready. So I, I believe there have been somewhere around 15, uh, maybe a few more or less, but about 15 of these approach and landing tests, including one last week. The thing is, Branson's not alone in this. He's got competition. Jeff Bezos worked about three times with Branson's work uh, from Amazon. Started his own space company. It's, it's in Seattle. It's called Blue Origin. And they're building a suborbital competitor uh, to Branson. And they've been out test flying vehicles quietly at the secret billionaire's ranch in West Texas. It's like something out of a movie. Uh, 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 since about 2006. And those two companies have competitors. x uh, which was recently in the news because they're moving their headquarters from Mojave to West Texas, is building a single stage to space airplane line vehicle. Their chief test pilot is an ex shuttle commander I used to fly Hornets with, uh, Rick Sirfoss. And there are other companies as well, like Mast and Space Systems uh, and Armadillo. Uh, they're all into this because they believe this is an important uh, uh, incentive there are fortunes to be made. And you know, there's an old saying in space flight, uh, how to make a small fortune in space flight, you should start with a big one. <laughs> <laughs> Bezos told me that wasn't his intention at all, was to make a bigger one still bigger. Um, and while most people think of this form of commercial space flight as uh, a tourist's game, it's actually uh, a real bonanza for the research and education community. You may not be familiar with that, but these vehicles are going to fly daily, in some cases multiple times per day, 
Many of the companies are planning to build and sell vehicles to others. Export has already sold one to Korea and one to Curacao. Virgin is building six under contract right now. And each of them expects that each of those Virgin vehicles should fly once a day. Export vehicles will fly four times a day. So we are on the verge, on the precipice of a space access revolution that's going to be a, a bonanza for space science and education, education and public health. We're going to be able to go into the upper atmosphere, not a handful of times a year, but every single day, day in and day out, of multiple sites around the world. We're going to be able to build up more microgravity time for experimentation, admittedly three or four minutes at a time, but more than the crew of the International Space Station can spend. And that's really with them. We're going to go from life sciences, understanding of the transition to zero gravity, only very healthy astronauts in very small numbers, to having thousands of people potentially getting involved in experiments. All the tourists, anybody who wants to be a part of it. And I can tell you that Jeff Davis, who went to Space Life Sciences Division at NASA Toronto Space Center, uh, could hardly keep himself in his seat. He's so excited about having a database with thousands of people a few years from now, rather than uh, very small numbers that he has today, and much broader range of uh, medical histories, types of people, etc. So it's not just atmospheric science. It's not just astronomy or microgravity sciences or life sciences. As I said, the ability to enthuse children to STEM careers, I think, is going to be something like the one in Apollo. When a teacher can walk into a classroom five years from now and start showing home movies from the space flight a couple of months ago, and most big school districts can afford $100,000 for, for uh, some rock star teacher around the Dallas Independent School District or wherever to fly in space. Or when a regular scientist, a guy like, like me, or any one of the speakers that's been here, can propose experiments and fly and go into the classroom and talk about, this is a part of what I do. Just like a geologist might talk about the field expeditions or an oceanographer about going in a submersible. I think it's going to be very powerful for education. And because the prices are low, combined with the high flight rates, I think we're going to see new applications that we never dreamed of, the same way as when computing went from being rare in the mainframe era to being routine in the PC era. Uh, if you want to learn more about this, um, there's a meeting that we hold every year called NSRC. Some of you have been, like Jeff. It's, it stands for the Next Generation Suburbital Researchers Conference. The first one was in 2010, and there were a lot of skeptics thinking there weren't that many people that were interested in using tourism. For science, 250 people showed up. We had the next one in Florida, and over 300 people showed up. This year, we had it in Silicon Valley, and over 400 showed up from the research community, spending their own time and their own money with this meeting. And the next one is back here in Colorado, June 3rd and 5th. Not a bad setting. So uh, uh, there's our website, and you can learn more about it there. Now. Uh, if the crowds that are going to those meetings, even before these vehicles are flying and experiments are flying on them, uh, are promising, um, I can tell you scientists are chomping at the bit to get out there and actually fly. And NASA has a program for this, although they won't fly scientists in the vehicles. Uh, they will fly experiments. It's called Flight Opportunities Program. And uh, they just selected another dozen or so uh, experiments in the Chief Technologist's office just recently. And the great power of these vehicles is not just that they fly frequently and that they, they fly inexpensively. Because after all, if they were able to fly frequently but they were very expensive, nobody could take advantage of them. It's being in that sweet spot of both of those criteria. Plus, because the tourist vehicles, you can fly the scientist with the experiment. And Dan Britt said it beautifully. Automation is tough. It's one of the toughest things we do in space flight. Being able to get rid of that automation, all the cost and all the risk that goes with it, is going to be tremendous. And I know that in my line of work in space science, we are used to being in this 50-year-long cul-de-sac where we have to automate everything because it's the only way we've been able to do it. We've never been able to routinely fly the scientist on the experiment. Um, but who knows better than the principal investigator or their graduate student how to do the experiment? And I've had some of my ex-colleagues at NASA headquarters so scoff at that because they're used to this mold we've been in where we only fly robots. And uh, they think, oh, it's just going to be a joyride. Well, I, I said, you know, if, if automation was so great, how 
come every university lab is an automated? It's just easier to not automate. If automation is so great, why isn't every geological field expedition done by every oil company done by robots? Why aren't all the submersibles unmanned? Why aren't all the airplanes unmanned aerial vehicles? Because when you put the person in the loop, you get a better result for lower cost and usually higher reliability. So in my institution, the Southwest Research Institute, we just like to get up front. There's no NASA program, but we're spending our own money to fly scientists in space, and I'm the PI of that program. You know it's real, because we have a patch. We do. Um, and we are already out. We have bought nine space flights, three with, uh, with Virgin and six with x -Corp. and developed three flight experiments, and our team is already in training, going out doing these things that are no fun at all, like flying F-104s, zero-G flights, and riding centrifuges, and so forth. And, and um, frankly, it is a lot of fun. And it is really illuminating. And we can't wait to go. Our experiments are built. But this is not the only form of commercial space flight. Um, although I think the world is going to be a real revolution. There are other things that are happening. And I want to tell you about those, too. Many of you have probably now have heard of SpaceX, Elon Musk's company. Uh, which he started 10 years ago with his own fortune, again made in the internet. It's pretty interesting. A lot of these come from the same place. Uh, he, he made his real fortune with PayPal. And then he started two companies, actually three he helped found, uh, subsequent to that. One is called Solar City, which is a minor partner in, uh, bringing uh, solar power uh, to cities. Um, one is a car company, an electric car company called Tesla. Uh, and SpaceX, which is the largest of his three companies, has grown over 10 years to be over 1,500 employees. And this company, which builds their own rockets and their own space capsules, is now one of the two providers of cargo to the International Space Station uh, for NASA. They have a $1.6 billion contract. They developed rockets from scratch. He's a big believer in what's called vertical integration, which means all the parts of the rocket, they build themselves. They don't go out and have subcontractors that build the avionics and another one that does the propulsion and a third for the structure. They do it all internally at SpaceX. So he can control the schedules and the costs better. And they've been pretty successful, but it took a while to get there. When they put their first Falcon 1 rocket up in 2006 and launched it, it blew up. Well, I think a lot of people thought, like a lot of new vehicles, they should have expected that. The first one used it doesn't work. You know, you can't really field test it until you get it out of the field. And it's kind of a controlled explosion. <coughs> they got an uncontrolled explosion. And some people thought that Musk would walk away, but he put another one up in 2007. And they launched that one, another Falcon 1. And it didn't work either. There was a lot more snickering in the big aerospace. But that guy's got spine. He put a third one up. And it was over money. And it promptly failed in 2008. And he didn't quit. He put a fourth one up about a month later. That one worked. And for the first time, a private company had put a payload in Earth orbit. Not a government, not a government space agency, but a private company. And they followed that up with a string of successful launches since then, and a much larger launch vehicle called Falcon 9. Um, it's now flown three times, all three successfully. It's about to fly a fourth time. Uh, it's a capsule that goes on top called Dragon. Uh, it was first tested in late in December 2010. Flew a textbook flight, a couple orbits around the Earth, parachutes back down and landed in the Pacific, not quite as close to California. This was actually a, um, an airdrop test done earlier. And if you were watching last month, you, you probably saw that in, uh, in June, they flew the first cargo run up the space station and successfully. This is actually imagery from that flight. There's the Dragon capsule. There is picture of it taken by space station astronauts. Here's another is that picking it up on the robot arm to put it into the vehicle. And SpaceX is now in competition with other companies to also provide crew transport to space station. And the interesting thing is the commercial space industry is showing how things can be done very differently. Who knows what rocket this is? Anyway? Not Ares. It's Ares. Right? Ares was, was um, um, built by and for NASA. Uh, this is the Ares-1, uh, which flew precisely one flight before a project constellation was canceled. It's a suborbital flight. Uh, it cost several billion dollars. Um, Elon likes to say that he conceived 
designed and, and flew all the test missions to the first successful orbital mission of Falcon for less money than NASA built the Ares launch tower. Somewhere between five and ten cents on the dollar. I'm not tweeting that. <laughs> <laughs> Do you work for NASA? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I used to, and it's a bad cul-de-sac. Things are very expensive when they don't need to. Now they've got a bunch of competitors. One of them's here in uh, Boulder County. Um, it's Sierra Nevada Corporation. They're actually all across the, uh, the country, but their space headquarters are here in Louisville, Colorado, just at the other end of Boulder Valley. And uh, they are competing with SpaceX uh, to fly this vehicle for crew transport. It's called Dream Chaser. And just like that discovery mission that Dan mentioned would soon be selected, the winner of, of this competition will also be announced in the very near future, potentially this coming week, but certainly in the next month or six weeks. And Sierra Nevada and SpaceX aren't going at this alone. Other companies are involved as well. Boeing has a space capsule that they've been developing, pretty innovative approach, sort of a skunk works approach um, with a large aerospace company. ATK has, is another competitor in that. And there are other parts of this revolution that's taking place, and I want to tell you about those. Not just vehicles to get someplace, but people that want to build someplace and put it in space. Bob Bigelow, who made his fortune in the hotel industry, uh, is now building space stations that he wants to rent to anybody that wants to see. And he's not just talking about tourists. Uh, what he knows from a big one, and, and his business team knows, is that the International Space Station is a consortium of just under 20 countries. But when you look on Wikipedia, so there are 194 nations on Earth. So 90% of them aren't involved. And he got the bright idea. They thought that many of those countries would like to have a slice of the space station if they could afford it. But they don't have the wherewithal to put their own up. So I'll put one up, and I'll rent it out by the day. And actually, if you divide the cost of a single seat going up there by 365, it starts to be a pretty reasonable price when you talk about short stays. And um, so you may not notice that Bigelow has had two test stations launched and on orbit for years. What do they call that? Uh, maybe Jeff remembers. But what does he call those? Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, these are big structures. These are, uh, this is in his Las Vegas. Uh, high bay in the factory. Uh, this is actually Bob Bigelow himself here on the right. Uh, you see he's thinking about lunar colonies someday. Um, and he's perfectly serious um, uh, about um, uh, private space stations. And what we're beginning to see, and this is one of the most interesting things, is not just private space companies contracting to government or to consumers like to fly as a tourist on a similar we're starting to see business to business deals. Just recently, SpaceX announced a deal uh, with um, uh, Bigelow Aerospace to provide transportation to that space station, and Boeing did the same thing. So we're starting to see a little bit of an economy develop in commercial space. There are some other things that are going on. Here's one that I'm involved in that's not so workable. Um, this is a part of the Google Lunar X Prize. It's a company called Moon Express. Uh, the principal two founders, an initial two, two investors in the company, are Naveen Jain, who was one of the first employees at Microsoft and, and therefore became uh, high net worth, and Barney Powell, a Stanford PhD in artificial intelligence, who worked at NASA for many years. In fact, I worked with him in the 90s. And then when he got bored, being a smart guy, he eventually got bored and went off in Silicon Valley and helped invent Bing, the search engine sold his company, PowerSet, for a big fraction of a million dollars, and, uh, a billion dollars, excuse me. And the two of them started this company, which is in the business of taking other people's stuff to the moon. Sort of like Bigelow taking other people's stuff to their space station. The idea here is well, we, Moon Express, and I'm the chief scientist for the company, um, will develop a series of small robotic lunar landers. Um, and we'll let people put payload on there, and we'll rent your payload space. So you don't have to learn to land on the moon yourself, you don't have to develop that system, but if you've got something, whether you're a NASA experimenter, or a CNES experimenter in France, or Canadian Space Agency, or whether you're a private industry, um, we'll fly it for you. We'll fly it to the moon, we're gonna make a reliable flight system, and we'll fly these shared payload robotic missions over and over. And then we wanna to progress to sample return, 
and then to uh, to mining, to actually returning precious metals from the moon um, years from now. Um, we're not so uh, so few craft oriented. We actually have a test lander that's been out flying in a high bay at NASA Ames under a space act agreement uh, for us. We've sold out the entire first mission. Uh, not just experiments, but we're also flying commercial payloads. Um, probably the most interesting is um, from Celestis. Some of you know who they are. Celestis flies pre-mains in space, right? You see about these suborbital or orbital launches that carry, you know, somebody's ashes or dozens of people's ashes, you know. Um, sometimes you hear about, you know, um, an ex-astronaut's ashes or a, a Star Trek actor, right? but also just regular people um, who are enthralled. I have a friend here in Boulder County named Michael Eisner whose dad was uh, not involved in space exploration, but was always enthralled by it. And they flew, flew his ashes in space. So we're doing that. We got asked by Celestis to fly ashes to be the first to the moon. Um, they called their uh, space flight participants astronauts. <laughs> <laughs> they do. They do. Uh, we're perfectly happy, this is a commercial business, to do that in addition to experiments. We're also putting a telescope on the moon um, by the International Lunar uh, astronom uh, uh, astronomical Observatories, um, the ILOA, uh, we're building a test um, telescope. In fact, it's being tested on Mauna Kea tomorrow and the next day. And uh, we have a contract to build the flight model and fly it on our first mission. And it'll be operated over the internet by the ILOA. And they plan to fly a later dedicated mission with a much bigger telescope they will operate from uh, the lunar poles. Well, this rocket science thing, uh, I love this little, little uh, motivational uh, part. It says rocket science, it really is that hard, but the results kick ass. It really is hard. I think we'll see a lot of these companies fail. I think we'll see people get killed. I think we'll see people get hurt. I think we'll see a lot of orange fireballs. And that's just the way the airplane industry started. And even today, the one thing, the one fact that every airline CEO knows Every one of them knows there'll be another accident. Hundreds of people will be killed. They just don't know which of them has the X on their back, which day of the they're on. We're going to see accidents in the development of commercial space flight, and people are going to get hurt. But that's what opening a frontier is about. And the difference between today and the 80s and 90s is somehow we've gotten to a point where uh, the cells have started to really multiply geometric. The number of activities that are starting to take place in commercial space, from suborbital to orbital, from launch to robotic mission services to space stations, to tourist flights, to research, is really multiplying. There's more and more, and I think we'll see more and more. And where I think this is headed is to commercial space exploration. Not just the utilization of space to go into low Earth orbit or to send robots to but commercial missions to the world with human beings. And I think we'll see it in my lifetime. And I think they'll go further. I do believe that if we're going to see anything like the kind of development that Arthur C. Clarke and Stanley Kubrick imagined in 2001, it's probably not going to come in the way that we've been exploring space. With government led programs that are so large. That they, they never get off the drawing board, time after time after time. I think it's much more likely that we would have an operation like this late in the 21st century that's privately, uh, that's, that's largely privately funded by an array of businesses that want to conduct tourism, research, and other activities that they can market on the moon. Elon Musk has been very candid about his desire to fly to Mars to fly large numbers of people there and establish a colony. He wants to get prices down to a cost where you can do what European settlers did. You sell your home for a couple million bucks, and you give it to him, and he flies you to Mars, and you stay. Of course, that depends on a lot of uh, price breakthroughs, but that's really where I think the future is. In fact, <laughs> I think that the birth of this commercial space industry really is Star Trek begins. <laughs>